All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending another journal club. Um, we are very excited for this topic, you know, given the moment that we are living in. So we're going to talk today about building vaccine confidence. And our special guest, um, I will introduce in a minute, Dr. Leslie Eber. Um, I wanted to just go over, because we're going to do things a little differently, just to give and a lot more time to the conversation. Um, so we are going to have Dr. Eber um, give us a presentation on vaccine confidence and hesitancy. And then um, we'll go through and ask some questions and have time for more of an open discussion. But I wanted to just remind everyone of where we're at and what we're seeing. And you know, if you're following the numbers, um, what is being reported now is even um, higher um, numbers um, on the world of meter, but we do know that we are still seeing uh, um, escalated cases and um, more um, confirmations in the way of, I think on average, over 200,000 um, daily confirmed cases with a positivity rate in the United States of 11.28%. For Florida, over the last seven days when they averaged it out, I think our positivity rate has been 9.08% and we're over 1.1 million cases. So we do know that we're still in the thick of it, but fortunately, um, you know, we had a lot of great news. Um, I'll say starting last week, Thursday, and um, if you were like me on Friday night, reading everything after um, the emergency use authorization came out for the Pfizer vaccine. And on Monday, we saw the first COVID vaccine being given. So, you know, I think, um, like I said, everything was pretty timely and we wanted to make sure that we covered this and had a discussion on how to build vaccine confidence. And for that, I wanted to um, ha um, have Dr. Leslie Eber, who is, who's like amazing and authored um, the AMDA toolkit on um, this uh, and she'll share with you what she's been doing. But you know, just a little background on um, her activities. Um, I, I look forward to listening to her every Friday afternoon when we have our state um, task force, um, COVID task force meetings with AMDA. She is um, on the AMDA board. She's an advisor to the governor's um, COVID residential care setting strike team in Colorado and the president of um, CMDA, the Colorado Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine. And in addition to all of that, she <laughs> works um, you know, in in both the long-term care space, I believe, and in, um, in an outpatient setting as well, and just is doing some amazing things out in Colorado. So, um, Leslie, I'm going to turn it over to you and stop sharing so that we can bring your slides up. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my slides. Hold on. Let's see if this all goes well. Okay. Can you guys see my first slide? Yes, we can. Well, I want to thank you so much for having me um, at the Florida AMDA chapter. I've been a huge fan of FMDA. Uh, you guys have done incredible work with promoting education in the post-acute long-term care space. You have profound leadership. And so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So I really like um, Dr. Sanders Sapita's uh, first slide, and I realize I have to change my own. We should be talking about COVID-19 vaccine confidence and not hesitancy. But given that, this is a, a huge topic and um, one that we need to tend to at this moment. And so let's kind of see where we are. COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy is absolutely real, unfortunately. Um, a, uh, a publication from Krebs in JAMA in October 2020 really confirms these ideas um, for hesitancy and um, apprehension for acceptance of a COVID-19 vaccine. And they found that the most important factors were things that we would normally expect, efficiency, duration of protection, and lower incidence of major side effects. Other factors are um, it, whether it's an emergency use authorization, which it certainly is, um, was the vaccine developed outside the United States, and then special consideration for our long-term care staff and their concerns 
are being first, safety, and question about whether they were represented within these trials. And when we dig a little deeper about COVID-19 hesitancy, um, this is, it's funny that this might be a little bit older. It was done in November, 2020 by the University of Michigan. It looked at um, folks between 50 and 80, um, an older generation, which I guess I'm now a part of, which is distressing. And we see that 20% would get the vaccine as soon as possible. So only 20%, that is kind of surprising. 46% would get the vaccine, but wanna wait. And then another 20% are unsure about getting it and 14% wouldn't get it at all. And um, the reference is just below. I'm happy to share these slides. So hesitancy is um, real and it is something we need to talk about so that we can help people through this decision-making process for the COVID-19 vaccine. And so it's really important to frame the conversation appropriately. Um, the most important thing is, um, to frame it that this is what we've been waiting for. This is how we end the pandemic. This is how I save my life and every life around me that I care about. And that is a profound opportunity. And sometimes I think that that message gets lost when we're talking about the COVID-19 vaccine. But we do have to remember that this is a really a miracle of science and a huge opportunity to eventually take off our masks and be safer. I also really like to remind folks, and I, I've done this conversation with frontline staff over 20 times, um, and this is always something that uh, resonates with frontline staff, that for the first time in the United States, long-term care staff are first. We have risked our lives caring for our residents. We have put our lives on the line, sometimes with not enough PPE, and we get saved first, and that's right. And then it's important to meet people where they are, um, it's a pandemic, it's scary, and getting a new vaccine for an EUA can be concerning, and I think we need to appreciate that. Everyone has questions and concerns. It's important to listen and respond compassionately, answer questions with transparency, respect, and honesty. And then I think it's really important to share some of the raw data. So this is an incredibly busy slide, which I will share with you um, after the presentation. And it was just updated um, about 16 days ago. So it may have, the numbers may have changed a little bit, but it's really important to share that. Um, and I'm gonna make sure I can see this slide the way you guys can that 43,661 people enrolled in the Pfizer trial. And um, as of this slide, 41,135 people received their second dose. <clears throat> I'm sure more now, but that really resonates with people as well. Instead of interpreting the facts, sharing the facts. Um, for Moderna, it's 30,000 that were enrolled. And at this time of this slide, 25,000 had received their second dose. And then to point out a, a couple of other really important ideas about the vaccine. Of course, we really wanna emphasize its uh, effectiveness. 95% for the Pfizer vaccine, 94.1% from the Moderna vaccine. That's a home run. And I think going deeper into how remarkable that is, is worthwhile. And then talking about um, the severe cases. So nine for Pfizer, nine in the placebo and one in the vaccine group. For Moderna, 30 in the placebo and zero in the vaccine group. One death in the placebo for Moderna and no deaths in the uh, placebo group. The take home message here is this can save your life. And so it's really important to kind of um, bring that home. And I think people really appreciate seeing some of the raw data. Okay, so then we have to have a strategy for COVID-19 education. So once we've kind of set the stage and we've gone over some raw data, I think the next best thing to do is to go over some really commonly answered, uh, asked questions and answer them. So I've been doing some COVID-19 vaccine education for the past actually six months since the pandemic started. We started talking about this. And these were the top eight questions that I always had. And so what we'll do is we'll go over each one of these questions and then the answers so that um, it, you can be on the same page. It's really important to have these answers um, in your head because frontline staff can stop you in the hallway. And it's really important that we have the information that they need so that they can make a good and safe decision. Hold on a second here. 
So the number one question that we always get is, are the COVID-19 vaccines safe? That's on the forefront of everybody's mind. And I think it, um, it's beneficial to take some time when answering this question and just instead of saying, yes, they're safe, of course they're safe, um, to go a little bit deeper, to remind everybody that safety is the number one priority, especially for vaccines. The FDA is fully aware, as are um, the vaccinologists and the CDC, that we're giving this injection to a lot of perfectly healthy people and therefore safety is paramount. It's also important to remind everybody that in the development of the COVID-19 vaccines that, um, and in all vaccines, that the most side effects happen within six weeks. So we have a lot of experience with other vaccines recently, the human papilloma virus vaccine, meningitis vaccine, the new shingles vaccine. And so in the history of the FDA, we really see side effects, significant side effects within six weeks of getting the shot. But the FDA raised the bar for the COVID-19 vaccine and asked for eight weeks of safety data um, and received that for both Pfizer and Moderna. So we needed six weeks and we asked for eight weeks. The FDA also advises a minimum of 3,000 participants to assess safety in a vaccine. And here, just from the numbers we've seen, and then some of the future trials are going to be even larger. You know, 44,000 people participated in the Pfizer vaccine, 30,000 in the Moderna vaccine. So we had a minimum of 3,000, but we absolutely surpassed that minimum. And therefore, we have more significant safety data. So our ability to say that the COVID-19 vaccine is safe is compelling. We've exceeded our own standards. And then the next question always is, why should we trust the COVID-19 vaccine? There's been a lot of politi politicalization of this vaccine. Um, people are concerned about the EUA. How, how could we be sure that it's trustworthy, um, that we can believe the FDA? So it's important to say that the FDA is using the same standards that they've always used for decades to evaluate any vaccine. And no steps were skipped. Um, the only standard that is different is that we increase the standard for safety. It's also really reassuring to people to know that the FDA alone is not making this decision, but there are two advisory boards that weigh in. And this is important because there have been some emergency use authorizations like hydroxychloroquine and convalescent plasma that didn't really pan out the way we thought it, they would. But here, it's just another level of authorization. And so it, I go through that there are two advisory boards. One is for the CDC, of course, that's the ACIP, and then the Burback for the FDA. They look at the data independently. They have independent statisticians. And it's important to point out that they have no conflict of interest. They're not part of the government, anybody on these advisory boards. They are also not on the board of Pfizer or Moderna, and they're vetted for no conflict of interest. And so you have not one uh, association looking at this data, but you have three, and they're all going to weigh in independently. And that really leads to an increase in ability to trust this vaccine. So what about the new technologies for the COVID-19 vaccines? And there are many. Um, right now, I'm going to concentrate on for Moderna and Pfizer, the messenger RNA vaccines. And people have a lot of concerns about that, which is also understanding, uh, understandable. They want to know if these new vaccines, because it's a coding messenger RNA, kind of like DNA, DNA could that code for the virus for COVID-19? Of course, the answer is no. And many questions I have gotten about whether it could change my DNA, change my deno genome, uh, lead to uh, future problems with um, bearing children. So all of these are huge concerns and it's important to talk about them. I usually explain for messenger RNA that it carries instructions for a protein and not a virus. So it can't give you um, COVID-19 virus. Uh, the reason why we have to keep it so cold, negative 70 degrees, is it's not all that stable or hardy. So when we get the injection in our arm at uh, our body temperature, it can go into cells and give instructions to make the protein, but then it disintegrates and is destroyed pretty quickly. So, and it also doesn't go into the nucleus where our DNA is, so it can't change our DNA. 
So the next most common question that I get is about the emergency use authorization and what does that mean to me? And we've touched about the, uh, upon this a little bit, um, but to go into further, further detail, an emergency use authorization for a vaccine is used for a public health crisis. And it has a shorter process, but no steps are skipped and safety evaluation is not changed. The, uh, the definition of an emergency use authorization is to assess the vaccine's known and potential benefits and if they outweigh the known and potential risks. Both advisory boards, of course, review this data, but an EUA does not imply that the authorization was done in haste or that the vaccine is not safe. Some people say, well, how could it have been done so quickly? And then I kind of turned the conversation to the fact that the entire world had turned their resources to create this vaccine. And we took a lot of financial risk. So instead of waiting to see if Pfizer vaccine worked and then producing the vaccine, we did those steps at the same time. And it certainly did save a lot of time and made it so that we could present the a vaccine if it was approved more quickly to the general population. So then uh, I often get the question, when and how long I, will I be protected with the COVID-19 vaccine? And with this question, it's an opportunity to talk about transparency and honesty when we talk about the COVID-19 vaccine. There are things we know and there's things we don't know. So we really don't know how long the COVID-19 will protect us. Uh, a recent study from the New England Journal of Medicine talked about for the Moderna vaccine, after 119 days after the second dose, it looks like immunity is really good, but that's gonna be a moving target. So we're going to evaluate the immunity and protective nature of these vaccines as we go. In terms of when you will be protected, it's really important to stress to folks that these both these vaccines are two dose vaccines for 21 days apart for the Pfizer, 28 days apart from the Moderna, and that you must get both doses, that your um, protection after the first dose is really limited. And if you want that 95% protection, you really have to get both doses. They have to be the same vaccine for both doses. They're not interchangeable and protection happens one to two weeks after the second dose. And we, it's also important to kind of set the stage that this may be like a flu shot that we have to have a booster um, every year. The most uh, anticipated question, of course, for everybody I think on the planet is, will I need to still wear that mask? When can I take it off, my goodness? And um, that is a complicated question that deserves some time with a very specific answer. And so the first thing that I let people know is the day you get your COVID-19 vaccine, your first dose, you will have no more protection than the day before. And even two days after the COVID-19 vaccine, you will not have very much protection than the two days before you got the shot. So it's really important that we make sure that everybody knows that they continue have to continue wearing their mask after their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. I am concerned that people will get the first dose of the vaccine and then kind of let their guard down and then actually get a COVID-19 infection and end up even in the hospital. We do know that after seven to 10 days of the first dose, you do have some protection, but I think it's really imperative that we um, are very honest and um, make sure that our staff is protected with the truth that they really need to wear their masks between the first dose and the second dose. And then the next question is, so at two weeks after the second dose, can I take off my mask then? I mean, that sounds great. I want to do that. Um, and the answer, of course, is no, because even though you may be protected from COVID-19 disease, it's still really unclear is if you take off your mask and get some COVID-19 virus in your nose, could you pass it on to your mom, your grandmother, and could they get infected? and um, get a terrible case of COVID-19. So until we have herd immunity, then we can all take off our masks. We really need to continue doing all of the infection control processes, including wearing a mask, doing social distancing, washing your hands. And we really want the frontline staff to be well aware of this uh, important fact for their safety and the safety of everyone around them. 
I always remind staff that we are just a sliver of the population that will have the opportunity, the golden opportunity to get the COVID-19 vaccine early, but most people won't. And then it's very important to talk about the possible side effects or the expected side effects. So really there was no long-term severe side effects in the trials that were noted. Um, Short-term discomfort, just like you get with the flu shot, headache, muscle pains, fever, fatigue, pain at the ejection site were common. And they're definitely more pronounced after the second dose. They usually last one to two days. And it's important to prepare people for those short-term side effects because we wanna make sure that people come back for the second dose and that they know that those to be are to be expected and they don't mean that you have COVID-19 viral infection. Some of these symptoms are similar to COVID-19 infection. And so uh, the CDC has just published a way to discern what to do with staff members and residents if they have one of these short-term uh, side effects from the COVID-19 vaccine. And the CDC really goes through that if they have normal side effects from the vaccine that we would expect almost from any vaccine, I usually get it from the flu vaccine, of um, headache and fatigue, that they have an algorithm that we're supposed to use. Now, if any of the residents or staff after the COVID-19 vaccine have loss of smell or taste, if they're short of breath, these are not expected short-term uh, side effects. And then a COVID-19 test would be appropriate. Isolation, have the staff member go home, and you really want to look into those symptoms because they're not expected. Of course, they're more pronounced at the second dose, but they should be expected if you, when you get the vaccine. And I really encourage, uh, explain to people that this is really a good thing. So what I usually say is every time I get the flu shot, I do get some headaches and muscle aches. And I always think to myself, my body is amazing because I know that it is making the immunity and antibodies that I need to not get the flu this year. And so when you get these um, short term side effects, it's important that folks know that this is a good sign. You also want to say that if you don't get these side effects, it does not mean that your body is not doing its job. Again, we want to encourage everybody to come back for the second dose. And we will talk about, I think, later about the two incidences in, um, in England about um, anaphylaxis and how we should um, talk to folks about the risk of a severe reaction from the COVID-19 vaccine. So I know we'll cover that in a little bit. So what about special circumstances um, for getting the vaccine? And the CDC and the ACIP have gone through this in even more detail. I encourage if you don't have access to their slide deck, it is profoundly useful. Um, but the first question I always get, if I've had COVID-19 in the past, should I get the vaccine? Do I need to get the vaccine? And you should get the vaccine and it can be helpful to get the vaccine. And so we think that with those two dose com uh, combination from Pfizer or Moderna, that vaccine protection may be much um, more help, you know, significant, more durable and last longer than natural infection. So if you've had COVID-19 in the past, it is well worth your while to get the COVID-19 vaccine and it's safe to do so. So what about if you're having a COVID-19 infection right now? Um, is it safe to get the vaccine? And the ACIP and the CDC recommend that you should be feeling better, your symptoms should have resolved, you should be out of isolation, and then it's safe to get the COVID-19 vaccine. The other question I had, because there were a lot of tests, at least in Colorado and I think around the nation, that you could find out if you had antibodies from the COVID-19 vaccine um, infection, and a lot of people got those tests, and they want to know whether they really need to get the COVID-19 vaccine. And what I explained there is that those antibody tests are not always very reliable. It's kind of a 50-50 chance. So if you had positive antibodies, we're not sure if you did, please go and get the COVID-19 vaccine. 
And then what about if you had, or especially your residents may have had the monoclonal antibody treatments in the facility, should they get the COVID-19 vaccine? And there is some concern that having the monoclonal antibody treatment first and then giving the vaccine, the monoclonal antibodies may kind of inactivate the vaccine and make it so that that vaccine reaction will not be as profound and strong and durable. And so the recommendation from the CDC is to wait 90 days after the monoclonal antibody treatment, and then you can get the vaccine. So what about these things about allergies? If you had food allergies, seasonal allergies, if you had an allergic reaction to penicillin, are you safe to get the COVID-19 vaccine? And indeed you are. And the CDC kind of vetted this further with the ACIP slide deck. Now, if you have had a severe anaphylactic reaction to previous vaccines, right now the CDC recommends that you should not get the Pfizer vaccine at this time. And these are discussions that we really have to hone in on and explain to our frontline staff. So finally, where are you getting your information? And this is imperative. Social media is very um, effective and it can be scary at times. We wanna make sure that we tell staff that we say this out loud. You wanna get your information from reliable sources. The CDC, medical directors, providers, social media is full of misinformation and it's surprising how quickly it takes hold um, and the opinions that are based on that misinformation. I put a couple of um, some references on this slide and I encourage you to go to the AMDA website and look at their toolkit, it's pretty good. Um, and it has a lot of usable resources that you can give to your frontline staff. So I usually give to my frontline staff um, the frequently asked questions so they can take it home and kind of ponder it. The final thing that is really important is to tell your own vaccine story. I think being authentic and telling your personal story is really imperative. I talk to folks on the frontline staff about how um, I'm yearning for the day that I can walk into my own home and not be a risk to my family. That the weight off of my shoulders on that day will be profound and how I am looking forward to a day when I can take off my mask and go to a coffee shop and, and have a coffee with friends indoors without a mask. That sounds amazing. But mostly I want to be part of the solution. And then you lead by doing, discussing with the staff and family members your decision to get the vaccine, talk about your experience after you get the vaccine. And there's nothing that speaks more highly about a vaccine than if you get it. And so that is a, a very compelling part of vaccine education. And then just a, a few minutes on strategies to how to prepare, prepare your facilities to get the COVID-19 vaccine. And this is kind of a work in progress. Um, the American Healthcare Association, ACA, has a great checklist for facilities. And then I thought we'd talk a little bit about consents this is a moving target for sure. So by law, if you have an emergency use authorization for a vaccine, you do not need a consent. You are obligated by law to share that information sheet about the vaccine, but not to get a consent. So as of conversations yesterday afternoon between the American Healthcare Association, AMDA, CVS, and Walgreens, it appears that CVS and Walgreens will not um, demand a written consent in order to give the vaccine to staff or residents. Um, they're supposed to post that information. Um, this is you know, what we hear um, on their frequently asked questions on their websites for both CVS and Walgreens. And I hope to see that in the next few days. So that is kind of a pending situation. But we do want to make sure that residents who do not have the capacity to make this decision, you will need to talk to their MDPOA or their guardian or their representative. And you really do want to document in their medical record that you've had this conversation and that it is okay to give this resident the COVID-19 vaccine. In terms of some logistics, um, you want to make sure to have a large room for social distancing. Everybody wears a mask. Everybody is six feet apart. And you'll need three areas. You'll need a check-in area, a vaccine area, and an observation area. And 
you shouldn't have 20 or 30 people in this room. You really want to control how many people are in this room. I would say two people checking in, two people getting vaccinated, and two people in observation, that would be appropriate. And then a plan for residents who cannot be vaccinated in that room. And you'll want to divide your residents up into those who can walk through the vaccination area and those who will need to be vaccinated in their rooms. And so that is uh, my presentation. I thank you again for having me here today and happy to uh, answer any questions. Well, thank you, um, Leslie. I mean, you've given us a lot of information. I think the first question you may, you've, you answered a couple of times, I was looking through some information from the Kaiser Family Foundation, and I found that the um, vaccine confidence um, reporting that they were getting showed that 27% of the public remained vaccine hesitant. But when we look at um, even more specific groups, you know, there was a lot of variation based off, off of age groups, um, um, different racial groups, and even some um, political groups. How should we take that into consideration when we are dealing with staff hesitancy? I, I think that's a, a great question and one that um, I am constantly refining on how I, I present information to people and what is um, my strategy. So some other ideas that I think can be really helpful is to find common ground between what you hope to achieve and what matters to the people you're talking to. And so to really um, hone in on their values and their priorities. Using a trusted messenger is always really important. And if you can find a CNA or a nurse that feels passionate about getting the COVID-19 vaccine, you know, having them talk to other nurses and CNAs, that can be a very compelling conversation. Um, and then recognizing that different communities have different relationships with vaccination. I think that's imperative to show the respect and um, the idea that people have very different experiences coming to the table and it's important to acknowledge that. Um, and then evoke the right emotions. I think that's also another tip that I try to do. We know that fear really immobilizes people. It doesn't cause them to get the vaccine and shame is really ineffective. So you wanna really present a positive viewpoint on the COVID-19 vaccine. You can be part of a solution. You can save yourself, your family, your residents. Um, you have an opportunity to be a leader. And I know, I thank you for that. I, I know there are some facilities that are going to make this mandatory and others who are still considering. When we see that the staff may become weary in, in, in those um, situations, what approach um, would you recommend um, that we adopt to improve confidence in that situation when it be becomes like you have to do this? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And there's been a lot of talk about it, whether we should make this COVID-19 vaccine, whether it be Pfizer or Moderna or something else, mandatory. That is really kind of tricky because it doesn't have an approval. It has an authorization. It's hard to make an emergency use authorization uh, vaccine or medication mandatory. So I think that that's probably not a, a good pathway to go down. I would rather talk to people and put in the time and energy to see um, what are their barriers, what are their stumbling blocks, and work through that. Okay. Um, I also wanted to just ask, because we may have some staff um, who may be pregnant or breastfeeding, what considerations do we need to take um, for that population? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's one of them, but also one of the most common questions that we hear. So I would also refer people to the um, CDC ACIP um, slide deck because it has two slides all about um, how to address folks who may be pregnant or breastfeeding. Really, some of the take home messages, there's really no data um, to talk about how the vaccine could uh, affect for pregnancy. but in terms of it being an RNA vaccine, there's not um, a specific concern about that. And so it's really comes down to a conversation with the person and their OBGYN to see what their risk is, 
for developing COVID-19. And certainly if they're in a high risk group, it appears that the um, risk of getting COVID-19 while you're pregnant is greater than the risk of getting the vaccine. And so that is uh, one of the ways you can weigh out that decision, but it's really a personal decision. Um, it's certainly fine for pregnant women to get the vaccine, but I think it involves a further conversation. And the same thing with breastfeeding, we do not think that this is um, uh, shared in the breast milk, but again, a conversation about what is your risk of getting COVID-19 and um, talk about the fact that there isn't a lot of data for breastfeeding women, and then have that conversation with their OBGYN. And is there any information um, or special considerations for um, residents or staff who may have comorbidities or an um, immunocompromising condition such as um, HIV mm-hmm. or even beyond immunosuppressives? Yeah, and that's a great question, one that we get a lot. So in terms of um, in general comorbidities like congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, even a seizure disorder, which is um, originally on one of the screening questions for um, the one of the um, consent forms, there's no contraindication in that regard for those comorbidities or really any comorbidities besides anaphylaxis to a vaccine. In terms of immunosuppression, people with HIV, again, it's a conversation. We don't have any exact data, but really um, it's an opportunity. And certainly all of those folks are able to get the COVID-19 vaccine. We know with people with HIV that the risk of getting COVID-19 virus um, can be profound and it would be less risky to get the COVID-19 vaccine. And so those are the conversations that you should have. But those are, again, are individual conversations with um, different variables that should be had one-on-one. We had a couple of questions in from the chat. Um, when we're um, looking at side effects, what should we instruct um, the staff to do if they're experiencing minor side effects? Should they stay home? How would, sh- how would we go about reporting that? Yeah, I think that's great. So it's really, really important to report any side effects. There are two mechanisms from the CDC. There's the VIRS um, that you can, and you're really encouraged to report side effects. And there's something called VSAFE that you have to sign up for and you have to have a smartphone, but they will then send you a text message to check in with you every um, day of the week for, I think, one to two weeks and then weekly and then monthly. Um, So it's important to document and um, report any side effects. And so the CDC now has a metrics on their website about how to manage those side effects and what should we tell staff. And so basically, if staff are feeling run down and a little achy, but don't have a fever, as long as they're willing and able to come into work, they can. If they have a fever, um, the CDC recommends that um, healthcare workers don't come in with a fever, wait till the fever resolves, unless there's a severe shortage in your staff. Um, And then you can kind of go through that metrics through the CDC, but best to make sure that they don't have a fever and then they can come in as long as they're feeling well enough to do so. If they're having side effects that aren't expected, like loss of uh, taste or smell, or if they're having shortness of breath or a cough, then that's a different ballgame. And then you want that staff member to stay home and you want to get them a COVID-19 test to see kind of what's going on. Okay. And I know that, um, and I'm going to put this graphic up because I get, I've been asked a lot um, about the fact that more vaccines are in the pipeline. So what do you say to any staff or, or if there are the residents who may say, well, I want to wait for a different vaccination? Yeah, I think that that's a really good question. It's one I get very often. And so I think that it is everybody's choice, but here are my three concerns. Um, And I think you have to pose this in a very um, thoughtful way, but there's risk to any decision. So the risk to wait means that you do have a risk of getting COVID-19 disease, and that could be um, profound and uh, emergent. And so there is a risk for waiting. The other idea is, 
you know, the um, supply chain for these vaccines have kind of gone up and down. And I don't think I can promise you that if you wait, there will be a vaccine ready for you when you decide to get it. And so I think that we need to be honest about that supply chain. And then the third idea to talk about is sometimes people say, well, I don't want the messenger RNA vaccine. I want to wait until there's a different vaccine. And I think we also have to say that um, these vaccines in terms of efficacy, it's a home run. So you may wait for another vaccine and it may be only 50 or 60% effective. And so you may be okay with that or you may not be okay, but that's an important thing to weigh out when you're making your decision to wait. Thank you. And getting back to some of the questions that you were talking about around um, administration and how how long we should be monitoring people following, um, you know, either exposure or if they have an infection, how much time should pass if if, um, the resident or staff had been affected um, with COVID-19 before receiving the vaccine? And so um, if you've had, I hope I, I want to make sure I get your question right. On, I, so let me know if I get it wrong. Um, so if you've had COVID-19 vaccine, uh, COVID-19 infection, mm-hmm. and you feel fine, you had it a month ago, three months ago, three weeks ago, and you feel fine, you're out of isolation, you're back to work, it is perfectly fine and appropriate. And we encourage you to get the COVID-19 vaccine. If you had the vac- uh, COVID-19 infection three days ago and you're feeling ill and you're still in isolation, we do not want you to get the COVID-19 vaccine. You should wait until you're feeling fine, you're done with your isolation, you're back at work, and then it's okay to get the vaccine. And what is the guidance for anyone who's been exposed to um, a person with active uh, active COVID-19 infection? Yeah, that's a great question. And so the CDC kind of divides that out to depending on um, what venue you're talking about. And so for post-acute and long-term care, because we have N95 masks and a bunch of PPE, and I hope you all have the PPE you need, then they feel like, number one, if you're exposed, it shouldn't prohibit you from getting the COVID-19 vaccine. And there's no need to do any testing on any staff member or resident before they get the vaccine to prove anything so that they can get the vaccine. So if you have an exposure, um, that's okay. You can still get the COVID-19 vaccine. And as long as you're feeling well, there's no need to do any testing before getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Okay, perfect. And then, um, you know, on to more questions about the reactogenicity. I don't know if I said it right, but it is one of my favorite words now. Um, you know, I think there was, you know, I, I will definitely say I've, I've been on the um, All I Want for Christmas is a COVID vaccine train for a while now. And when the UK came out with that blanket statement regarding serious allergies um, last week, as a person who, I guess, fit into that um, little bucket, it was very alarming. Um, do given the clarification that the FDA made about it being with um, only with the vaccine um, history of a of of an anaphylactic reaction with following a vaccine, is there any other information or any other guidance we could give to those um, populations who may be worried um, not only about the Pfizer but um, the 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 Moderna vaccination? Is there any other reassurance we could offer them? Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, I think that's a really important question. And I think it unnerved all of us when we saw that, thinking, gosh, what are the ramifications of these type of reactions? And so I think that we can go through that next step of reinsurance that there were multiple people in the trials who had egg allergies, food allergies, allergies to penicillin, and there was no ramification to um, their getting the COVID-19 vaccine. And that's really important. And if people are concerned and they've had allergies, Um, it's important if they've had just allergies to oral medication, that's okay. And if they've had allergies to injectables or intramuscular medications, it's completely appropriate to monitor them, not only for 15 minutes, but an additional 15 minutes, a total of 30 minutes after they get the vaccine in your observation section of that room. And so just watching them, making sure they're doing okay for 30 minutes is appropriate if they're nervous or if they've had non-anaphylactic reactions to previous injectables, that would be appropriate too. 
And have we seen any unexpected side effects um, since um, the Pfizer vaccine is, um, we've started administrating, administering the Pfizer vaccine? It seems like everything's going really well. I mean, there was that a little bit bumpy start in the UK with those two episodes of um, anaphylactic reactions. But so far here, I haven't been hearing anything. And so, you know, hopefully we're all good to go. I think uh, there's a lot of excitement and a lot of positivity. And so hopefully that's the only reaction we'll see. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I have another question from the chat. Will we need to continue with testing for COVID after we completed administration of the vaccines to the residents? That's a great, great question. Of course, it is. So uh, that's a two part answer here. First of all, it's 95 percent effective, but there is that 5 percent. And if one of your residents started having a fever and hypoxia and loss of smell, um, you should test them for COVID-19. That would be appropriate. We also, even though this vaccine was indeed tested in older folks, um, they haven't been tested in our nursing home type residents. And we kind of have a different type of resident with a lot more comorbidities, sometimes much more elderly, um, sometimes with frailty. And so we believe that the COVID-19 vaccine will be very successful in uh, mounting an immune response that will be helpful. But I think we don't know, you know, what that exact percentage will be. And so again, if you have residents or even staff members that present that are very suspicious for uh, COVID-19, they should be tested. And it's also important to know that getting the vaccine won't change the results of that test. So if you're PCR positive, it's not because you've gotten a COVID-19 vaccine, it's because you have an infection. Thank you. And it just one other question that I see, when we're thinking about um, allocation of um, the vaccine, the, the distribution, is there any um, further guidance from either the CDC, the CDC on um, who should be next after we've um, done the first responders and the, the long-term care population, who would be in that 1B, 1C um, group? Yeah, I think that's a great question too. So the ACIP had um, taken, you know, their uh, guidance from the uh, National Academy of Medicine, and it was all incredibly thoughtful. But then it comes down to each individual state. And so I've seen a lot of phased um, distribution from each um, from many different states, and they're all a little bit different. So I think it will be important to look at Florida and see what your phased distribution looks like. For, for you so that you've got it right. And this, this way, when you share that information with either your colleagues or your friends or family members, that you'll be accurate for the state of Colorado and for the state of um, Florida. Sorry, that's my default. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, have you seen any recommend, recommendations for surveillance testing following completion of the two-step vaccination process? You know, I think that surveillance testing and different testing and that it's being done and, you know, some of that information was just published out of the Moderna trials. And so certainly the trials are looking at um, after you receive the vaccine, um, what about asymptomatic um, COVID-19 infection? How often does that happen after the vaccine? And so that kind of surveillance testing is is being done at the trial level. But to my knowledge, it's not recommended after you get the vaccine just um, for purposes of immunity if you're not in part of the trial. So um, I think uh, another question that came through, we know that um, Pfizer ha- is under EUA, um, Moderna is going through the process and we anticipate that they're going to be approved probably by Friday. When will these vaccines get a full approval? And what is that process um, to get them to full approval? I mean, and that is a much more lengthy process. They say that the amount of paperwork to get that approval is like as high as the Sears building if you had printed out every piece of paper. Um, And so I think that, you know, I know that Moderna and Pfizer are going to go after that approval. It will take a certain amount of time, more paperwork. um, And uh, so that will be a longer process. And it's hard to say how quickly that process will happen for official approval. But that's my my best uh, 
amount of information for you. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Eber. Um, does anyone have any other um, questions? I invite you now to um, come off mute if you want to ask the question directly and you did put it in the chat box or if I missed your chat question. Wow, it's pretty quiet. <laughs> I know, it's unusually quiet. Um, I know we, I don't know if we still have Dr. Shepke on the line. I don't know if you have any insight or comments from us. Um, he's the state EMS director for Florida Department of Health. Well, sure. First, Dr. Ebert, that was fantastic. Absolutely on point and, and perfectly accurate. I really appreciate the presentation. Um, we, I've been working out on the, the, the vaccine mass work, uh, the mass vaccination work group at, at the State Emergency Operations Center for a while. So I think we're reading a lot of the same sources and, and you did a really, really great job of simplifying it and getting it out there for everyone. I would just say one, uh, one or two minor things. For the folks that have immunosuppression, one of the things that we're doing that we're having our teams do is certainly by all means, you can get the vaccine. That's not a contraindication like Dr. Ebert mentioned. Uh, but I would warn those folks that when we say 95% efficacy, that's in folks with normal immune systems. Mm -hmm. So I would not want these folks to drop their guard, so to speak. Yes. So I would tell them that, yeah, we think it's going to work on you, but we don't know this is an apples to apples comparison when you immunize someone with a normal immune system and someone with a weakened immune system, whether it be for HIV or any other of the many reasons why people might have weakened immune systems. Um, and for the, uh, the uh, lactating mothers and, and, and uh, pregnant and, or expect to get pregnant. Uh, I, I think most uh, folks in the science realm believe that these vaccines are probably safe, but there's a lack of data. So there is a black hole there. And so I think all of us are a little hesitant to say, hey, go, go ahead and get this without looking at your personal individualized risk and benefits until we know a little bit more. So it's not that you should be afraid, it's just that uh, there's lack of data. So we can't give you a clear, concise, scientific answer until we know more. But uh, I think I think other than that, you know, obviously I think Dr. Abar already touched on those points, but absolutely fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for that. And, and, thank and you. I completely Abar. agree with everything you just said. So thank you for <laughs> kind of honing those points. I think they're really important points to hone in, especially with pregnancy and um, uh, breastfeeding mothers, it's important to know that there is no data and it is a very individualized um, discussion and decision. And uh, so I thank you for your comments. Well, let me ask one other question that just came through. Is there any information, um, and I appreciate what you said about immunosuppressed uh, people who may have immunosuppression, if we have a person who's on high dose steroids or people with multiple allergies, is there any um thoughts or, or recommendations for those individuals with getting the vaccination? A, I think that's a great question too. And I would um, uh, go back to the, our previous conversation that it really is an individual decision that needs to be made between the person and their doctor talking about what kind of medications they are on, what is their risk of getting COVID-19 um, and weighing out the fact that we don't have a lot of data in this patient population. So I, I think it is a very individualized um, decision and it has to take some care um, into kind of making sure that you're making a decision, number one, that feels right, right to you, that you have all the knowledge that we could possibly give you knowing that there is a bit of a black hole for this patient group. And, um, you know, weighing out your personal risk, I think, will be really important in that decision-making process. Thank you. Well, I um, I know everyone is asking about if, if we're going to get access to um, Dr. Eber's slides. They will be up on our um, in our COVID-19 library. I Thank you, um, um, Dr. Eber, Leslie, I, I thank you so much. And Dr. Shepke, thank you for your comments. And everyone who is on the call and has been on our journal clubs um, throughout the year, I, I, I thank you. We will be back in January, um, you know, January 13th with more information and more updates and um, clinical relevant topics around um, COVID. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to email us. Um, we are, we're still here. Please be safe over the holidays. Thank you very much. Thank you.